everyone. Welcome to Eden Valley. We're happy to have you here. My name is Chelsea. I serve as the lifestyle director of our lifestyle program here at the Institute. And you may be wondering, what is this beautiful place? Um, you've come to hear from Barbara O'Neill, but you may be wondering also, what is the, the Institute and what are we about? And so we're going to show you a four minute video um, called, What is Eden Valley? So you can have an idea of what we do here, what we're all about, and then I'll introduce our speaker for tonight. For over 60 years, Eden Valley has seen the power of God transform lives. With a Christian perspective on health and wellness, it offers natural treatments and biblical wisdom for your total body, mind, and spirit. During the fall of 1961, Pete and Ann Boris, together with Harold and Effie Grossball, attended a supporting ministries convention at Oak Haven in Michigan, where they were deeply impressed that they should open a self-supporting institution dedicated to spiritual growth. In 1962, Eden Valley Institute of Wellness opened its doors at the foothills of the Rocky Mountains National Park. It all started with a nursing home. Later, a medical missionary training school was created to prepare young generations for missionary fieldwork. A lifestyle center was established a few years later. Implementing God's natural laws of health, the guests experienced rest, healing, and peace in the beautiful nature surrounding the property. More importantly, they were brought to the knowledge of Jesus, who can give true healing, both physically and spiritually. God designed our bodies with the incredible ability to heal themselves when given the right conditions. And so at Eden Valley, we seek to incorporate these ideal conditions for the healing of our guests. Today, the Lifestyle Center still uses simple treatments that have brought health and happiness to thousands of people over the years. These treatments include hydrotherapy, fomentations, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, herb supplements, water, lots of water, exercise, proper rest, and plant-based nutrition. Physically, uh, I just feel like a new person. Uh, I can walk two or three miles with no problem. When I first got here, uh, every step that I took, I'd have to take a breath and stop for a moment before the next step. Our energy has gone up and, and our mental stamina is just, everybody's changed. They don't look the same. The tumor shrank by 87% the first time I was checked. So then the next day when they checked me, 95% gone. You're not just being told what to do, you're being taught why to do it. And that makes all the difference. At Eden Valley, students come from all over the world to learn hands-on how to become medical missionary evangelists. The program covers principles of medical missionary work and an understanding of Christ's healing methods for soul winning. The students acquire practical skills in both disease-preventing natural treatments and biblical knowledge. Before I came to Eden Valley, I was in Southeast Asia for several years and I saw a lot of things and so many times I thought, I wish I knew how I could help these sick people, but I didn't have the skills and I didn't have the training. When I left Asia, I found Eden Valley and it was exactly what I was looking for because it trained me to learn all of those things that I had wanted to learn for so long, simple things that sometimes we take for granted that I knew would be able to help people all around the world. Besides the six-month medical missionary training program, Eden Valley also offers a nine-month comprehensive farming program. The world is in short supply of farmers. We believe it is our responsibility to share the knowledge and help prepare workers who understand sustainable farming in such a critical time. In the Agricultural Leadership Training Program, students learn all aspects of sustainable farming and farm management. Courses include areas such as greenhouse and field crop production methods, soil science, equipment repair and maintenance, basic accounting, marketing, Christian leadership, and more. 
Eden Valley Farm supplies pesticide-free produce for the Lifestyle Center and eight local farmers markets, being a blessing to the community. Eden Valley also supports ministries in India, Tanzania, Mexico, Hungary, and the Dominican Republic. With the mission of transforming lives through scripture-based education, natural remedies, and spiritual nourishment, Eden Valley is a place of healing where every guest, student, or community member can experience God's love in a practical, tangible way. Uh, find out more information. The best way to about what you just saw, you can talk to one of our staff members in the foyer after the after the lecture. A couple things, please do not live stream the lecture that is happening. You may record it on your phone, but we ask that you please don't live stream it. Also, our store is going to be open for one hour after the completion of this lecture. So if you'd like to um, go to our country store, just down the road this way, our staff will point you in the right direction. Um, it's about a three-minute walk from here. Um, you may go there to buy Barbara O'Neill's book, Self Heal by Design. And we also have um, many other teas, supplements, um, various things like that that you can check out. Okay, without further ado, I'm happy to um, welcome... Barbara O'Neill, and we are very happy that she's here, very blessed um, by the information that she's about to share with us. As you can see, we are a Christian um, institute, and so if you bow your heads with me, I'd love to, to, to pray for her and all of us. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you have given us the blessing of healing and restoration in our bodies we pray for Barbara. We're thankful she's here and ask that you would bless her with your spirit to present an insightful lecture that we may leave this place with more growth and more knowledge to continue on each of our own healing journeys. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> Thank you and welcome everyone. Do you know Chelsea came to Australia? She worked at Misty Mountain for three months. We didn't want to let her go, but we didn't want to rob Eden Valley either of a very good worker, Chelsea. So tonight I'm going to take you on a journey through your gastrointestinal tract. It's a very interesting journey. The journey that changes the food that's on our plate to microscopic little substances that get absorbed out of the gut and into the blood. It's actually a hollow tube. And anything that goes into that hollow tube is not part of you or me until it gets, gets broken down and then absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you or me. Leviticus 17, 11, the Bible says, the life of the flesh is in the blood. So this astrointestinal tract is a very important part of our body because the way it breaks down the food influences whether we get everything that we need out of that food. So let's begin. Our journey begins in the mouth. The mouth is the only part of the whole of the gastrointestinal tract that we have say over. We have say over what goes in. We have say over how long it remains in the mouth. We have say over when it goes in, whether it's every two minutes, every hour, or the time-restricted eating, which is a, the popular way of eating today, just twice in a day. We also have say over how often it goes in. We have say over the environment of entry. So as you will see as we go down this tract, this is the only part that we have say over. And what goes in, when it goes in, how it goes in, how long it stays in, all of that influences what happens further down. So what goes in? Is it nourishing food or is it fast devitalized food? When it goes in or how often? All through the day or just at mealtimes? And when we get to the stomach, we'll look at how that affects the stomach. It's also... It's in the mouth. The only exposed bone in the whole of the body is in the mouth. 
And there's a reason for that. That's to chew up the food. There's no teeth in the stomach. <laughs> so we have to chew, chew, chew. Long, very famous doctor who wrote many, many books on health in the late 1800s, early 1900s. If you don't eat your nuts till they're a cream, all those little bits you don't chew, they actually just come out the other end and you haven't accessed the nutrients in those little bits of nuts. We also have, um, it's important that it stay in the mouth a little bit longer because as the food's in the mouth, messages are going to the brain and the brain message the other organs further down. The protein coming, there's a bit of fat coming. So it alerts the other organs as to what's coming down and they're getting ready. But if someone's going choo-choo swallow, choo-choo swallow, the organs are saying what's coming. The, the brain says, I don't know, I don't know. <laughs> I, I can't assess it. It's not in their mouth long enough. It's a good idea when you're eating to put your knife and fork down between, between mouthfuls. And look out the window. It's nice to have a nice view as you're eating your dinner to encourage chewing. Also, when you chew very well, you, you make a larger surface area for the enzyme. Most people don't realize that digestion begins in the, in the mouth. So let's have a look at the digestion that happens in the mouth. The mouth is an alkaline environment. And tylen, tylen is a salivary amylase and it breaks down starch. So starch digestion begins in the mouth. There's no tylen in a baby's mouth. And there's no tylen in a baby's mouth until the molars are through. So the first teeth that come to a baby are four at the top and four at the bottom. They're called milk teeth because that's what babies should be eating, milk. <laughs> it's also taste time. That's the time when you give the baby a piece of uh, cucumber to chew on. That's the give the baby a piece of apple to suck on, a bit of celery. This is taste time. And what you'll notice in, say, a little eight, nine, ten-month-old baby that's got maybe four or five teeth, they want to do what you're doing, so you... By then they can sit, by then they can feed themselves, and they've got a few little teeth. I remember seeing my grandson with a piece of cucumber, who's about 10 months. By the end of the meal, there were lots of little bits of cucumber all over the tray and little bits of cucumber all over the floor, and I think a few got in. That's the way to start. Notice what they start with, just pieces of fruit or vegetable. And it's not until the molars come through, they come through here, and that can be anywhere between <clears throat> 14 and 22 months of age. And when the molars come through, then the grinding, they're the grinding teeth. And what do we grind? We grind grain. And it's then and only then that tylen is released in the mouth. And tylen is the enzyme that breaks down starch. That's why babies should not have any starch until the molars are through. That makes sense? And yet what are many mothers told today? Feed the baby rice cereal at six months of age. Six months of age? My babies didn't even have teeth at that, that stage. They couldn't even sit at that. <sighs> Let alone have the enzymes in the mouth to break it down. And there are many people with gut problems today because if you go way back, they were fed starch too young as babies. And so mothers are told, you've got to feed the baby starch because if you don't, or cereal or something, the breast milk doesn't have enough iron in it in the second month of life. Did God make a mistake? Have you looked at the growth of a baby in the first six months compared to the second six months? They don't need as much iron. No, God never made a mistake. And so I never gave my babies really hardly any food, maybe a bit to, to chew on, till really well into their second year. The other, the other food that's broken down in the mouth is saturated fat. So your saturated fat is coconut, palm, butter, and it's broken down in the mouth from the 
enzymes that are released from the sublingual gland, and it's called lingual lipase. Lingual lipase is the enzyme that breaks down saturated fat. The polyunsaturated fats, the monounsaturated fats, they're, breaking, they're broken down further down, as we will see. But saturated fat is unique in that the breakdown begins in the mouth. They're the only two foods that are broken down in the mouth. Then we come down the esophagus, and here the gateway into the esophagus is the cardiac sphincter. It's called the cardiac because of its nearness to the heart muscle. And many an emergency nurse and doctor can tell you, people come in, they're having terrible pain, they think they're having a heart attack, when actually they've got reflux or heartburn because that pain is right there. So what is reflux or heartburn? Or sometimes it's called GERDs. Well, the acid's coming up. Why is the acid coming up? I think everyone can see my little why down here. We should always be asking why. Because there's always a reason. Why is the acid coming up? And by the way, if the acid's coming up, what's the person given? Antacids. You will see the stomach is the only acid part or the only acid environment in the whole body. And it should be acid. In fact, it must be acid to be able to break down our protein, as you will see. So if, I, if someone says to me, I've got an over stomach, I say to them, fantastic. You must be breaking your food down well. Did you know that dogs have 10 times the hydrochloric acid of humans? And they don't have heartburn, and they don't have reflux, and they don't have stomach ulcer. And by the way, have you seen what they eat? My daughter's dogs brought the, the dead cow from over the road, a, a leg. And oh, we knew because of the smell. And the dog's eating it, and the dog doesn't die. That's because they've got such strong hydrochloric acid. So if someone says to me, I've got too much acid in my stomach, I say, fantastic. You must be digesting well. But by the way, how do you know? Well, it keeps coming up. The, it's not the acid. The problem's the gate. It's like having a garden. And, and the cows keep getting out of the paddock, or you call it a field, and into the garden. So you shoot the cows. There's no need to shoot the cows, just shut the gate. Just shut the gate. There's no need to shoot the acid, just shut the gate. So why does it come up if we've got a double-layered valve there? Usually because people are eating breakfast like a pauper, lunch like a pauper, and supper is the king and the queen together. And what should we be doing? Uh, breakfast like a king, lunch like a queen... Supper like a pauper, and you know sometimes paupers don't eat. That's what it should be. We should be having our largest meal at the beginning of our journey, which is our day. And then an, another substantial meal in the middle of the day. And then at the end of the journey, you don't fuel your car up. At the end of the journey, it's at the beginning of the journey, the beginning of the day. And so when someone's rushing all day, no time to eat, no time to eat, little pick here, little pick there, and then end of the day they're starving, they had a huge meal, then they lie down and, oh, what happens? They fall asleep or they go to bed. What's happening now? That food, gravity is causing the food to push against that little valve. It's not the odd day that happens and it's not the odd day it doesn't. It's what you do every day that determines the health status of your body. So this valve starting to get weak. It's a muscle. It looks like this. And when it's relaxed, it's closed. And when you eat food and this esophagus starts moving and the muscles start contracting, that cardiac sphincter contracts, opens, and the food goes through. But something else that causes muscles to contract is stress. So if someone's stressed and their muscles are tightening, that can cause that little valve to open and you put on top of that that it's weakened because of the, the food pushing against it of an evening. And they're two of the main reasons why people experience that heartburn or that reflex.
Everyone that comes to our retreat with heartburn goes home without it because we give them magnesium to relax and close that little cardiac sphincter. And also we serve the main, the main meals at breakfast and lunch. Now we come into the stomach. This is the next organ. And the stomach is an acid environment. So let me draw the lining of the stomach for you. The stomach has big folds like this, and those folds are lined with gastric glands. And three quarters of those gastric glands release mucus. And mucus forms a thick mucosa wall over the lining of the stomach. And that's designed to protect the stomach from what's released here. What's released here is hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid is an important enzyme in digestion because hydrochloric acid connects with pepsinogen. And pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid unite and release pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that breaks down protein. Protein is broken down in the stomach under the action of pepsin. Hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen will only unite in a very acid environment. And pepsin will only work in a very acid environment. So it's very important to keep that hydrochloric acid nice and strong. Hydrochloric acid plays another role, and that's antibacterial, antifungal. It's a wide-range antimicrobial agent, and that's why the dogs can get away with eating rotten food because their hydrochloric acid is so strong. Also, from these glands here, the intrinsic factor is released, and the intrinsic factor is the enzyme required to absorb B12. Let me give you the B12 story. And Dr. Neil Nedley, by the way, he shows in his book Proof Positive that B12 is found in organically grown root vegetables. So there'd be lots in these wonderful vegetables grow here. B12 is also found, uh, because it's an airborne bacteria, it's found on... Um, say you're eating berries off a tree, you're getting B12. You're eating an apple off the tree you're getting minor amounts of B12. So let me show you what happens with B12. B12 is linked with an R protein in food. And when it comes into the stomach, hydrochloric acid releases the R protein. So now we've got B12 released. Can you see that if someone has low B12, that, that release may not now, from the glands here, the parietal glands, the intrinsic factor is released. Maybe this is intrinsic factor. So now intrinsic factor and, and B12, they're floating all through the small intestine. And when they get to the last part, which is the ileum, B12 and the intrinsic factor unite. And then it's absorbed into the enterohepatic circulation, which is a circulatory system involving the liver. In fact, it keeps in circulation until you need it. And the research is showing someone can have no B12 in their diet for 30 years before they show a deficiency because it circulates. Most people that show B12 deficiency, it's because they lack the intrinsic factor. So if someone has low hydrochloric acid, well, the antacids certainly would cause that. I met one man, he'd been on antacids for 25 years. I'd like to ask you a question, is it working? 25 years? Well, the good news is he stopped at our retreat. He started taking a third of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper with every meal. That'll wake up hydrochloric acid. That'll wake up your glands to release hydrochloric acid. And he never again went on his antacids after being on them for so long. So as you can see, it's important to have an acid stomach because it's the acid, the acid stomach that allows pepsinogen and hydrochloric acid to unite and release pepsin and pepsin breaks down protein and it must have a 
uh, strong acid environment for that to even work. Some people are protein deficient purely because they're hydrochloric acid deficient. So what would deplete hydrochloric acid? Eating every two hours, all through the day, uh, eating the largest meal at the end of the day. Do people feel like breakfast after they've eaten the largest meal at the end of the day? No. Drinking with the meals. What drinking with the meals does is it waters down the hydrochloric acid. And isn't that, well, I know it's an Australian habit and I think it's an American habit too. If you sit to your meal well hydrated, you will not need to drink with your meal. But it certainly is a habit and a lot of people do it without even thinking about it because every restaurant you go to, what's the first thing you're asked? What would you like to drink? And we usually say, ah, oh, no, thank you. And they look very challenged by that. <laughs> So we let them put water on the table <laughs> because it's such such a habit. And and yet it it works. See, see, digestion's a chemical process in the stomach, and water dilutes the, the chemical, which is your hydrochloric acid. Stress inhibits the release of hydrochloric acid. So as you can see, there are a few things that deplete hydrochloric acid. What can boost it? The juice of a lemon just before a meal, that'll boost it. Uh, a quarter of a cup of hot bitter tea, even hot ginger tea, that will boost it. A third of a teaspoon of cayenne pepper in a little water just before the meal, that'll boost it. If someone's thirsty straight after a meal, a mouthful will not make a big difference. It's more the eight ounce of water <laughs> with every third mouthful that that really waters down hydrochloric acid. And now we're moving down through a little gateway called the pyloric sphincter. And the pyloric sphincter is an interesting gate because in the morning when we wake up, it's open. And that's why warm water in the morning goes straight through. But when we smell, look, Think, food, sit, first few mouthfuls go in, the pyloric sphincter shuts. And it stays shut, it has sensors. It stays shut until it senses that this food is broken down and then little by little bits of food go through. But let's say someone's eaten breakfast and then mid-morning they have maybe a, a donut and a cup of coffee. Maybe they're a bit healthy and have a salad sandwich and a cup of tea, or maybe they're really healthy and have an apple and a handful of nuts. Whatever it is, as soon as it comes in, pyloric sphincter shuts immediately. Something's just come in, it's not broken down. And so breakfast basically has to sit there. And what does it do in this warm environment? <laughs> it starts to ferment. And if there's a bit of meat in there, it starts to putrefy. And often that's when the person starts to get bloating, starts to, you know, starts burping. And finally, the apple and the handful of nuts, whatever it is, joins the rest of breakfast and then starts opening again. But a half an hour, an hour later, lunchtime, quick, shut the gate, something's just, can you see what's happening? And they have found, they've done experiments on Loma Linda universities and they have found that they still had some breakfast in their stomach at the end of the day. That's eight hours later because they were eating every couple of hours. Time-restricted eating, where can I put time-restricted eating? Time-restricted eating is a, comes from the 5-2 diet, the uh, intermittent fasting, and they're showing now that eating Six hours apart in a 24-hour day is the most effective way of eating for the stomach, for the colon, diabetes, weight loss, even mental health. They're finding um, excellent study results from this time-restricted eating. And yet what have diabetics been told for the last 30 years? You've got to eat every two hours. <laughs> As you'll see, the food is not absorbed in the stomach. 
it's actually not till it comes down to the small intestine that the food starts to be absorbed. So when you've got an empty stomach, you're not going to die of starvation because the, the nutrients are being absorbed further down. That's why when the children say they're dying of starvation, they're not. <laughs> they're not. I, I never gave my children food between the meal because I used to look at my girlfriends, you know, they'd give them a lolly or candy, they'd give them a chocolate, and then it's time to the, for the meal. Are they interested? A child's not going to eat a broccoli after you've just given the child a chocolate. <laughs> no, it's got a bit of common sense there. But I just used to give my children food at mealtimes. And if they said they were hungry, I'd give them a drink of water <laughs> or I'd divert them. They often say they're hungry when they're bored. And their gastrointestinal tract is the same as ours. So then we come through the pyloric sphincter to the duodenum. And the duodenum is the first part of the small intestine. And there's a lot happening in the duodenum. And the duodenum is an alkaline environment. The only part that's acid is the stomach. Now, to ensure that the duodenum is alkaline, the pancreas releases sodium bicarbonate, and that neutralizes any stomach acid that might come through mixed with the food. But notice here is the liver, and the liver makes bile. And that bile is stored in the gallbladder. That's what the gallbladder is. It's just a reservoir for bile. One lady said, I don't think I can digest my fats anymore. My gallbladder's gone. I said, well, your gallbladder doesn't make bile. The liver does. And the gallbladder is a reservoir for bile. That just holds it. But your liver's still making the bile. So let's have a look at the organs that are in are coming into the duodenum, the liver. The liver releases bile, and bile is the enzyme that breaks down polyunsaturated fats. Remember the saturated fat starts in, the breakdown starts in the mouth. What we've also got coming into the duodenum is the pancreas. And the pancreas does more than most people realize. So we just mentioned that it'll release sodium bicarb, and that's to ensure that the duodenum stays in an alkaline environment. But the pancreas releases pancreatic lipase. And pancreatic lipase is an enzyme that further breaks down the polyunsaturated fats. So the breakdown begins under the action of bile and then it's further completed under the action of pancreatic lipase. And the pancreas also releases pancreatic amylase. Do you remember the other time we saw amylase? Tylen is a salivary amylase. So... Starch digestion began in the mouth. When it came into the acid stomach, it's put on hold. And then it comes into the alkaline environment of the duodenum and pancreatic amylase finalizes the starch digestion. Began in the mouth, finalized in the duodenum under the action of pancreatic lipase. The pancreas also releases trypsin. And trypsin is an enzyme that finalizes protein digestion. Now, where did protein digestion begin? Protein digestion began in the stomach, and then it's finalized in the duodenum from trypsin. And there's another trypsin called chymotrypsin. So we're just going to put trypsin, trypsins, there's two trypsins, and they break down the protein. Let me give you a scenario of what sometimes happens. Let's say the person's drinking with their meals, eating all day long, hydrochloric acid's exhausted, they're, they're eating on the run, 
rushed, stressed. So there's not a lot of hydrochloric acid in the stomach. You see, protein looks like this. This is just an illustration. And in the stomach, under the action of peps, um, <clears throat> under the action of pepsin, the protein's broken down to peptides and polypeptides. When it comes into the duodenum under the action of trypsin, the trypsins, the peptides are broken down to amino acid, the polypeptides are broken down to peptides and amino acids and then amino acids. But when someone's drinking with their meals, eating all day long, stressed out, some full proteins get down into the duodenum. And the pancreas says, what are you doing here? And, and the protein says, I'm sorry, they're drinking with their meals, they're eating all day long, there just was not enough hydrochloric acid in there to release the pepsin to break us down. And the pancreas says, I'll do what I can. And maybe the trypsins can only get it down to peptides and polypeptides. Only amino acids can be absorbed out of the gut and into the blood. So we're getting down to the small intestine and halfway down the small intestine, all your nutrients are absorbed. Halfway down, so about here. But the peptides and the polypeptides, they can't be absorbed. They can only be absorbed as amino acids. So they actually continue on and they come to the colon and the colon says, what are you doing here? And the peptides and the polypeptides say, oh, sorry, but <laughs> they're drinking with their meals, they're eating all day long, there wasn't enough hydrochloric acid and Trypsin did what he could. But And so the colon has to create a lot of <clears throat> bacteria which produces a lot of methane gas. <sighs> And how does the methane gas come out? <laughs> the other end. And that body doesn't get that protein. It comes out the other end. The protein, the protein is broken down by proteolytic enzymes. So proteolytic enzymes, proteolytic, proteolytic enzymes are pepsin. Another proteolytic enzyme are the trypsins. But God, in his wisdom and mercy, put some proteolytic enzymes in foods. And in the core of the pineapple, you will find a proteolytic enzyme called bromelain. That's why when you eat pineapple, peel it, slice it into rounds, and then cut the rounds in like wedges. So everyone will get a tiny little bit of the hard core. Because if you cut all the sweet flesh off and you're left with the core, that's heavy going trying to eat that. <laughs> but if everyone just gets a little bit, they're getting a little bit of bromeline. The other is, uh, we call it pawpaw, I think you call it papaya. The seeds in the papaya contain a proteolytic enzyme called papain. Now, we don't advise black pepper because black pepper can irritate the lining of the gut. But if you collect your seeds from your papaya, wash them, dry them, put them in your pepper grinder, they look just like peppercorns. And they hot, they have a bite to them. And you can put that over. So if someone says, do you have black pepper? Just give them the... Won't taste exactly the same, but it has a bite. If someone has pancreatic cancer, psoriasis of the pancreas, they often die very quickly because they die from malnutrition. Can you see why? Because the pancreas is actually the main organ of digestion. The pancreas does more than any other organ in digestion. It finalizes 
the polyunsaturated fat. It finalizes the starch digestion. It finalizes the protein digestion. So if someone has a compromised pancreas, pancreatic cancer, they should take digestive enzymes. And you can di buy digestive enzymes that have bromelain and papain in them. We now come to the grand finale of digestion, which is where the nutrients are absorbed out of the gut and into the blood. Lining the small intestine are villi. And up the middle of the villi is a lacteal, and the polyunsaturated fats get absorbed into there. And all through the villi is a blood capillary network. Remember I said that anything that goes into the gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny substances, then it becomes part of you or me because it's now in the blood. Lining our gastrointestinal tract is a thick turf wall and that thick turf wall is made up of lactobacillus acidophilus, bifidus bacteria, call it the healthy or the friendly bacteria. When we were in our mother's wombs, our gut was sterile. And when we were born, we were literally showered with our mother's microorganisms. I was watching a documentary on gut flora, our microbiome, and they were interviewing an obstetrician and he said, we always thought God made a mistake putting the birth canal and the anus so close. In fact, 50 years ago, if you went in to have a baby, they always gave you an enema because they don't want anything coming out of the anus when that baby starts to be born. And this obstetrician said, we now know it's a perfect design because when the birth canal stretches open, so does the anus. And so the air coming out of the anus, what's it rich in? Uh, all the mother's gut flora, and when the baby's face hits the air, the baby goes, ah, and what's it breathing in? <laughs> it's breathing in the air from the anus. Notice what the obstetrician said, it's a perfect design. They have found babies born via caesarean section have more skin flora in their gut than gut flora. And I was talking to a farmer, dairy farmer. He said if a, if a cow dies in calf when it's giving birth to a calf, if we don't get that calf onto another cow that's just had a calf, we may as well put that calf down. It will never be strong. They will never be healthy because they didn't get that colostrum. In fact, he said, if the mother's still warm, we get the calf and squeeze the colostrum out of the mother's teeth because that baby will never be strong unless it gets the mother's colostrum. You see, it takes three days for milk to come into the breast. In those first three days, there's a thick, creamy substance called colostrum, and it's rich in the microbes. And about this area here on the colon, there are little things called payers patches. There are lymphatic lobes, and they're an important part of our immune system. And through the small intestine, there's also little payers patches here and there. And in those payers patches, are, because it's part of the lymphatic system, they contain lymphocytes. So this gut flora is an important part of the building of our immune system. So it's very important that the baby have the colostrum in the first three days of life. And little by little, this gut flora builds up. This gut flora is responsible for the final breakdown so what do I mean by final breakdown when you consider that these enzymes have done all the breakdown, particularly it causes a release of the B vitamins. These microbes are responsible for the absorption of the nutrients out of our gut and into the blood. 
these microbes protect the blood against any harmful pathogens that might be in the gut. These microbes nourish the cells that line the gut. No wonder Hippocrates said all disease begins in the gut. And he didn't know what I've shown you here. So then the million dollar question is, well, what would compromise or break down that gut flora? Antibiotics do a good job. One writer said, taking an antibiotic is like dropping an atomic bomb in the gut. What did the atomic bomb kill? The good and the bad alike. And that's what antibiotics do. They're not selective. Drugs are like robots. They come in, I must do. Don't interfere with me, I must do. They just kill. Whereas herbs, they work with the needs of the body. 104 verse 14, the Bible says that God gave herbs for the service of man. They're there to serve. That's what herbs do. They work with the body. Aloe vera, fresh aloe vera from the plant. Did you know that it contains microorganisms? So taking aloe vera early in the morning can help. And notice how slimy it is. Well, that's actually just what your gastrointestinal tract is lined with, slime. So that aloe vera does a wonderful, wonderful work of, of putting a nice coating on the gut plus adding to the good gut flora. It interests me that most... Countries that I go to, traditionally, they always had a cultured food as part of their diet. So if it's in, if it's in Asia, it's um, miso and kombucha. If you go to Europe, you get sauerkraut, you get the sourdough bread. Many countries, there's yogurt, there's kefir. So all those cultured foods contain lactobacillus. And lacto when you're taking that food, it just helps to maintain the good gut flora. It's called the healthy or the friendly gut flora. And it's very important, as you can see, for the absorption and protection of our gut. Statin drugs. Statin drugs can also cause a compromise or a breakdown of our gut flora. Antibiotics do a very good job. I'm not against antibiotics. They've saved lives and they will continue to. But the problem today is the overuse of antibiotics. Most people should go through their life never having them at all. And the World Health Organization have stated the biggest health care risk today is the overuse of antibiotics. And our students here at uh, Eden Valley Lifestyle Retreat are learning simple natural treatments, especially next week when we go into natural remedies of things that you can do without having to resort to drugs. Drugs never cure disease. It is true, they can save a life in a crisis. We're not talking about a crisis, we're talking about disease. So what also can kill gut flora is long-term painkiller use. I've met several people who've had serious back injuries, were addicted to narcotics, and got off them by changing their lifestyle, changing their diet, drinking more water, and exercise. You see, when you have a serious injury that may affect the bone, you've got something else. It's called ligaments, tendons, muscles, and they can be built up to compensate for injuries. Isn't that good news? Also refined sugar. Refined sugar just feeds the yeast in the gut. And when you've got antibiotics or long-term painkiller use or you've got statin drugs that are killing off the good guys, your lactobacillus, your bacterias, then the sugar comes in and just feeds the yeast. Now we've got a compromise in the final breakdown. We've got a compromise in the absorption. We've lost part of our protection. The cells lying in the gut have lost their nourishment. Most of the food, in fact, actually all of the food should be absorbed halfway down the small intestine. So when we come down the end of the small intestine, we come to the ileum. And this is the ileocecal valve. And the ileocecal valve is a one-way valve. And it opens as the food comes through. And when the food comes into the large intestine, it's liquid. 
And one of the main functions of the colon is to take water out so stools are formed. But if a person's dehydrated, more water gets taken out than should be taken out. Then we're left with rabbit pellets and cement. Notice there's a little organ there called the appendix. And the appendix has two important roles in the function of the colon. One is that it's called the, the colon's oil can, so it lubricates the contents as it goes through. And it's also releases antibacterial fluid. When vegetables break down, they ferment. When meat breaks down, it putrefies. Now, dogs can get away with it because their gut is one yard long. Ours is 10 yards long. And so if a person's had a big steak and on top of that they have a glass of wine and then they have ice cream and chocolate flavouring, which is, can you imagine when it comes out of here, it's pretty, pretty toxic. And so the pancreas, the appendix, sorry, has to release antibacterial fluid to calm it down till it gets through. So the pan, so the, the colon very important that we promptly answer nature's immediate call. Got that? When the colon says go, you got to go. When you feel to go, this part of the colon fills up, which puts pressure on the anus, and that's our feeling to go. The problem is that there's a muscle. See this little red it's a muscle, it's called puborectalis, and it holds the last part up. And we're very happy for that because it prevents us having accidents. But it also, and it should, and the problem is that people feel they go, but they don't go because they're on the phone to a friend, uh, they're watching a movie, uh, they're reading something exciting in the book, uh, they're digging a garden and they don't want to go yet, they're knitting and they want to get to the end of the road. None of those things are crises. But people think, I'll go in a minute, I'll go in a minute. And then they get off the phone and the documentary finishes and et cetera, et cetera. They finish the garden. They come inside, they see it, have you noticed, can't go because it can't stay there. So what, it's, what it does is it goes back, goes back into the last part of the colon and the water continues to be taken out so it's actually getting drier and drier and harder to pass. And so the person sits to try and encourage things along and, oh, something gives. It's called hemorrhoids. We'll, we'll rub those out because they're not very nice. So it's very important to promptly answer nature's immediate call. When your body says go, you got to go. Also hydration. Hydration keeps the stools soft. Fibre. We need fibre not only to sweep the colon, but we also need it to encourage peristalsis through the colon. Colorectal cancer is very common in people that eat fast food. Lots of meat, which has no fibre stressed, not drinking enough water, drinking too much tea, coffee, soda pops, which all dehydrate. So no wonder colorectal cancer is, is uh, high amounts in countries that, that live like this. Position is also important. Let me show you why. When I go to Africa, I was in Africa in April, I went into the bathroom and there's a hole in the ground. <laughs> oh, it's all tiled. It is actually a, a bathroom. When I was in India, I saw the same thing. When I was in Asia, I saw the same thing. When I was in Singapore. And it's the most natural way to actually evacuate daily. But let me show you what's happening when someone's sitting on the throne. Here's the throne and the person is doing their daily evacuation. When a person sits puborectalis, that muscle at the end, it's, it remains taunt. Things still get through, we know that. But if someone is sitting on the throne and maybe they've bought a squatty potty or they've put a little stool in front of the, the throne so that when they're sitting, they're in the squatting position, when a person goes into that squatting position, puborectalis relaxes and when it relaxes, the colon opens and the person can pass the contents with much greater ease. It prevents hemorrhoids and it certainly can 
can help to heal hemorrhoids. So what about if someone's going too much? It's called Crohn's disease, colitis, gastritis, ulcerative colitis. It's important when someone is going that fast to take herbs to slow things down. And there are five foods that are incredibly irritating to the lining of the gut if it is already irritated. And this is dairy and the hybridized wheat of today. The hybridization of the wheat created a very complex protein structure, which makes it difficult for a compromised gut to break down. Oats are very high in a plant chemical called lectins, and lectins can increase inflammation. Peanuts are commonly contaminated with mold, which is a toxin to the body, and refined sugar. And we find that when these foods are eliminated, it allows that inflamed colon to heal. Also, there's a herb called slippery elm. And slippery elm is the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree. And it coats, soothes and heals the lining of the gut. If someone's going 10 times a day, they can take that every hour. You see, it's the powdered bark of the slippery elm tree, so it's like a, a fluffy bark. And when you put hot water with it, it goes thick. And when you drink that, it coats, soothes, heals the lining of the gut. Something also very interesting about slippery elm is that it contains a growth stimulant. So it stimulates rapid healing in the lining of the gut. I'll give you a story to illustrate. We had a man attend our program. I said, what's your reason for coming? He said, I'm here to support my wife. She had a few health problems. He was late 60s. I said, do you want any medication? He said, yes, I'm on cortisone because I have irritable bowel syndrome and I'm on anti-inflammatories. I said, oh. He said, the doctor told me two weeks ago that he can do no more for me. How long have you been on the medication? 15 years. He said, I walk every day and I walk along the coast and there are four toilets. So I go four times. I know where they are on my morning walk. So in the first hour of the day, he's going four times. This is on medication. I said, what do you have for breakfast? He said, ah. He said, I usually have toast with uh, peanut butter and honey. I have a cup of coffee with milk and a couple of teaspoons of sugar. I said, what do you have mid-morning? He said, oh, another cup of coffee and a couple of biscuits. You call them cookies. Lunchtime, oh, he says, I have a sandwich with uh, cheese and ham. Cheese is particularly irritating for this gut. Another cup of coffee and maybe bowl of ice cream. What do you have for tea? Oh, steak, um, pasta, more wheat. And he said, a uh, cup of coffee with uh, milk, a couple of teaspoons of sugar and a couple of Jack Daniels. His food <laughs> was irritating the lining of his gut. I said, um, can I try some things on you? He said, sure. So we gave him slippery elm four times a day. He was going six times a day, full diarrhea. First two days were juicing and his stomach was very happy. His gut was happy because there was no solid food going in. I said to him Tuesday, so this is just starting the second day, I said, how's the gut going? He said, really good. He said, I've stopped bleeding. He said, the cramping and the pain has stopped. So I saw him Thursday morning. I said, how's it going? He said, amazing. He said, my stools have started to form. He said, I haven't seen that for a long time. I said to him, actually it was Wednesday, because I said to him, well, if I were you, I would stop your anti-inflammatories. The fact that there's no diarrhea, the fact that there's no more bleeding, the fact that there's no more cramping, what does that tell you? It's calming down. 
So he stopped his anti-inflammatories. Now, if it had start diarrheaing again, we've got two choices. Go back on the anti-inflammatories or go back on half-dose anti-inflammatory or just take Slippery Elm every hour. But there was no reaction. In fact, on the last day he was with us for a week, he came running up to me early in the morning because I came to have breakfast with the guests. He said, I've just gone on a walk and I haven't gone. <laughs> Now, remember why this man came? He was not interested in our health retreat. He just came to support his wife. And do you remember what his doctor had told him? I can do no more for you. Now, the cortisone, I said to him, you've got to go ease on that one. <laughs> He's on 20 milligrams of cortisone mm, after two weeks down to 15. Maybe another two, three weeks down to 10. So just slowly ease off that. But he had no idea that this food was actually contributing to the irritation. I've got three sons, all in their 30s. Actually, my eldest son is in his early 40s. They have oatmeal for breakfast every day. Love it. But you know what? They haven't got irritable bowel. See, it's not that those foods are necessarily bad, although I don't eat peanuts because I they're contaminated with mould. If you love peanut butter, try almond butter, try cashew butter. So you'll find that there are alternatives to them all and there's no need for refined sugar. You've got honey, you've got maple syrup. Mill uh, millet's a nice alternative to oats and there's a website where you can get a delicious gluten-free bread. It's called Simple Needs. In fact, apparently a lot of his bread now is in most sprouts Yep, and uh, wholefoods.com. So there's so many alternatives today that you can use. And we have seen many people totally heal from Crohn's disease, irritable bowel, colitis, gastritis. That's good news. You see, we live in a body that can heal itself. And it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. And many people are sick because they're not aware of those conditions. And we've had many guests come that are not aware that these foods actually are like kerosene to a fire on an irritated colon. It's not necessarily forever. It's just until it heals. <laughs> Some people find that their gut is so compromised that they actually need to keep away from that. We have a body that speaks to us too, so listen. What about hemorrhoids? What can you do for hemorrhoids? With hemorrhoids, it's important to uh, make sure you're in the squatting position so you haven't got pressure on that anus. And you can also make some suppositories. 50% coconut oil and 50% castor oil. So what you do is you melt the coconut oil, you mix them together, and then you get a rubber glove, or not a rubber glove, but a disposable glove, and you pour it in to the glove. And you tie it off here and put it in the fridge, and now you've got some suppositories. <laughs> So when you need one, cut it off, peel, peel that uh, disposable finger off, and then it just gets inserted before you go to sleep at night. And then while you sleep, that castor oil and that coconut soothe, soothe the whole area. So that's a simple suppository that you can use to help heal hemorrhoids. So I'd like to thank you for your attention tonight. I notice you're all still awake. It is a fascinating journey, the journey through the gastrointestinal tract. And I love the proverb, Proverbs 14, verse 6, that says, Knowledge is easy to him that understands. So my aim tonight was to give you a knowledge of your gastrointestinal tract because when you know how it works, then you know how to treat it. I'd like to end with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much for our gastrointestinal tract. 
And thank you so much for the information on the conditions to give it so it does us well and we can access the nutrients that we need out of our food. Thank you for hearing our prayer tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, and thank you all for coming. On this Thursday evening, we have another presentation.